This is Amy Howley. Eddie Pendarvis and I were talking about Ohio's Written Education Plan, or WEP, for advanced learners. We decided to record the conversation and share it as a way to open up conversation with you about the WEP. How would a student's particular area of talent be relevant to decisions about and plans for his or her education? Well, in working with gifted children in the past, gifted students, I've found that many are advanced in everything, almost every academic subject, but many are also advanced in just one or two subjects, at least at the time you test them. So for those that need a challenge because they're advanced in, say, language arts, you need to look at what's their current level of performance there, provide challenges, acceleration, more complexity, more depth in that subject, and agree the people who are working with the students writing the WEP need to agree on, including the student, him or herself, agree on what is the goal this year or what are the goals in that particular subject area so they can focus on advancing the student appropriately. What about interests and learning styles? How would these be relevant to decisions about and plans for a student's education? Well, it's easier to talk about interests as they affect education and planning for education than it is learning styles because it seems to me that interests clearly go along with strengths, that what students are good at they tend to be interested in and vice versa. So to the extent that you can, aligning a student's interests with their studies while at the same time trying to broaden their interests seems the best path for engaging them and challenging them. Learning styles, there's less convincing research about how important learning styles are and what, how to think about them even, whether you're talking about visual versus auditory or analytic versus synthetic, how to even think about learning styles can be uh, hard. But one thing that I noticed in being around students who were gifted in dancing, for example, and the same thing I think would carry across subjects, but I noticed that some teachers and students tend to learn things synthetically. Like if they're learning a new dance, a new ballet, the teacher who has that learning style or prefers it will teach the dance synthetically, will teach the dance or big parts of the dance over and over and expect the students to learn it as a kind of gestalt. And some students do well and pick it up that way. They remember well, they fit the whole together. And then some teachers break a dance down for their students, gifted and otherwise, teaching a few steps at a time, getting, being sure the student has learned those, and then going on. And some gifted students learn better that way, analytically, breaking things down, learning a logical sequence one bit at a time. So considering that with gifted students, I think is important too. That's one of the main ways I think learning style might be considered if you see a difference uh, that a student maybe is not picking things up as quickly as their giftedness suggests they should. How might students' level of academic functioning be relevant to plans for their education? How advanced a student is makes a big difference, of course, in how you're going to try to accommodate and promote their learning. And several students come to my mind when I think about the level of academic functioning. If it's um, not a major difference, you might have a student who's 
in the fourth grade who goes to fifth grade for math class or fifth grade for language arts. But when it's more extreme, it, it can be scarier to people. And I'm thinking of a kindergartner who went to a rural school and she was, they found that she was reading at the third grade level and were very upset, not sure what to do with her. And they decided to go ahead and have her go to the third grade for reading. And though the teachers were worried about it, it worked out beautifully. She was comfortable, it, maybe partly because it was a small school, but she was comfortable with the third graders and enjoyed going to that class as one of the best parts of her day. And the students all treated her well. So um, sometimes you have to look at cross-grade placement and maybe a little more grades than just one or two. And I also think of another student, a young woman, when she was about 12, she was near a community college. And so she, to accommodate her advanced levels in math and science, they had her start early college, but in a community college rather than the university. She took a couple of classes at the community college, and then when she was about 13, maybe a year later, she took classes at the university level. I believe a couple of sophomore level classes when she was about 13, and that was in her town so that it didn't mean that she had to go to a university far away from her home. So that can, it can be harder if there's no college nearby. That's an interesting question. Let me restate it to make sure I'm understanding. You asked, what about social and emotional functioning? How does knowing how well students are functioning socially and emotionally help with educational planning? Well, in general, advanced learners do very well socially and emotionally. So in most cases, there's no need to treat them as having special social and emotional needs. In a few cases, students who are gifted might feel socially isolated or experience emotional difficulties. Sometimes, as in the case of math anxiety, those difficulties have a bearing on their learning. Well, what about perfectionism? I know that some parents and teachers feel that gifted students, many of them, are just too anxious and have to have everything they do be perfect. Is that an emotional issue that needs to be dealt with on the web? I think in extreme cases, it probably does, but in many cases, it's really the fact that students aren't given a lot of opportunities to make mistakes and to learn how important it is to make mistakes as a way to learn. And so if a student is always performing right at the top of the class and never makes mistakes, then the student learns that making mistakes is a bad thing um, and doesn't learn that it's important to make mistakes in order to be able to try out new things and be more venturesome in learning. So I think that, that that's a practice that happens in classrooms when teachers make it okay for all students to make mistakes. So the next question is, what is an annual goal why is it important to specify annual goals for advanced learners, including students who are gifted? And we're actually struggling with that a little bit and want to have a little bit of a conversation about it. So, uh, so what do you see as an annual goal and why is it a problematic question? Well, one of the things that I think about with annual goals is that it's a way to get people to focus on you know, this is where we want the student to be but oftentimes it can be hard to get people to agree about where a student should be in a year 
a parent may have a different idea than the teacher, for example. And often annual goals for acceleration, moving a student beyond the grade level into another classroom setting and taking different tests is something that there may be disagreement about. So I think one important aspect of annual goals is that they force people to talk about it and agree on what's where do we want this student to be at the end of the year and sometimes that will vary quite a bit in terms of what people want especially it may be true for underachievers who do well on tests but may not be performing as well in the classroom and the teacher may disagree that the student's ready to move on so I think another piece of the annual goal picture has to do with the fact that um, that the expectation is that that the teams write SMART goals, which are kind of like behavioral objectives in that they are very specific and they have measurable targets as the outcome. And um, if you are tracking performance at a level of one step following another step following another step in the acquisition of knowledge or skills, they work really well. When students take huge leaps in their learning, it's harder to specify exactly how far they're going to get along a continuum of learning. And so many times the expectation is not high enough. If a student is um, reading at the third grade level, um, in the first grade, kind of logical expectation, if you aren't thinking that the student is really advanced, might be that the student is going to be reading at the fourth grade level by the end of the year, or maybe the fifth grade level. But what often happens with students who are advanced is that they make huge leaps. And so when I worked with students um, in uh, a gifted education program, some of them started reading and by the end of the year, in the first year they had learned to read, they were reading at the eighth grade level. And so those kinds of dramatic leaps are not something that that's easy to quantify in advance in a plan. But the idea of specifying where you hope a student will be helps with all students to make sure that you're holding high expectations for them. And so in that way, I think goals are important. If you have a student who is interested in literature, maybe a kid in the fifth grade who likes to read and enjoys writing, one of the things for an annual goal might be to develop that student's interest in writing through a goal that may, for example, say uh, the student will be able to write, use multiple sources in writing an essay that states a thesis and provides evidence in support of the thesis. Now, I, I don't know whether that would be considered too detailed or not. Um, it certainly would be a starting place to talk about a goal for the student if that was the student's interest. So I, I kind of like that idea um, for a goal because it connects to the curriculum. It fits closely with the ELA standards in Ohio, so I think that that is a strength of that goal. Um, I, th I th you know, one of the problems to me is always um, how are we going to know that we've gotten there? And if um, we don't have a rubric, for example, attached to that goal, then maybe we're not really sure what a performance is going to look like for a student who tries to achieve that goal and I'm thinking that any teacher might be equally confused. So one point therefore of an annual goal might be to tell teachers where to begin to work around developing the curriculum materials and assessments that would show accomplishment. The idea of a SMART goal is that it's measurable 
but the goal itself might not be the measurement method. Um, so I could see a lot more work needed on a goal like that to actually put in put it in place in a way that a teacher could tell whether or not the student could now write such an essay, and if not, where the student would need to, um, to develop further as a writer in order to be able to write such an essay. One of the things that I'm sure happens in doing that would be to look at the student, that they've looked at the student's current level of performance in writing, and then in developing a rubric, if they did decide that was uh, an appropriate goal for, for that student and the student was excited about it, looking to an old, a class, higher level classroom, I'm sure that there are rubrics that would be appropriate that maybe at the junior high level, middle school level, or maybe even maybe even at the sixth grade level. I'm not sure when students develop essays with a thesis that they're trying to support with evidence beyond the most basic. What kind of curricular interventions might help advanced learners reach their annual goals? Okay, there are many curricular interventions to working with, for working with gifted students and working for advanced learners, whether they're identified as gifted or not. But among the most common are probably learning centers where students work either at a computer or with paper materials that are geared to both above grade level and below grade level to individualize for students. So learning centers would be certainly a popular way to address some of the needs of gifted students. Cluster grouping is used sometimes in schools where student uh, principals or whoever places the students in particular grade levels will have one classroom have several advanced students in it so that a gifted student is not always working alone. In the past sometimes the gifted students have found themselves sort of isolated when their needs were so great that they had to have advanced materials and for some reason they were not able to go into a higher level classroom and had to work on their own with independent study materials. So cluster grouping or at least pairing students together can be a way to overcome that isolation. Compacting so that students can skip some of the classroom material that they clearly already know and move on within the classroom to assignments that are at a higher level or more advanced level, either at that grade or beyond it. One of the things to be sure to do when you're working on developing the web where you are accelerating a student and they're doing work that is above their classroom placement or grade placement is to be sure that, that they're going to get credit for high school work if they're doing high school work, that they're getting credit for college if they're doing early college, and what kind of are they going to test uh, with their grade peers on some of the tests, uh, some subject levels, but in their accelerated subject that there's uh, people are sure that they're tested at the grade level in which they've worked. So curricular interventions typically look at how are we going to make the pacing right for the student by giving them work that lets them move at their learning rate. How are we going to make the learning deeper and more complex? And it's a combination of acceleration, independent work, group work with peers, and materials making assignments a little different even though they may that geared to the students interests and level even though they may be in the same classroom and look very much like the assignment that other children use just differentiating in the way you would for any student So another part of the WEP is specifying some progress measures that are applicable to the student and the annual goal the student is 
trying to attain. Um, so can you give me an example of uh, a progress measure that might make sense for a student who is looking at a uh, kind of work to um, address an advanced goal? Yes, uh, in some cases that is really easy. For example, if we have a student who's gifted in science and who is maybe in the sixth grade but taking an AP chemistry class, then the progress measures would be the same for that student as for other students in the AP class in regard to that annual goal. The student would take the same formative assessments as the other students in the AP class, would take the same final exam, and that would be a measure of their progress toward that annual goal. And of course you would encourage them to take the college take it for college credit they don't have to but to take it for college credit if it seemed likely that they would do well enough to later be given credit when they go to the university for that course a harder assessment might be one for the language art a uh, language arts goal that is that's conducted through cluster grouping or through individualization within the classroom and then the teacher is is going to be probably developing some formative assessments and a fin uh, final exam or summative assessment related to the content for the language arts annual goal. Developing a written education plan gives us a lot to think about. It helps us achieve greater focus and make wise decisions for the education of advanced learners, including students who are gifted. Eddie and I hope you'll continue to think about the issues we've identified in this webinar. We encourage you to talk with your colleagues to figure out good ways to serve all students in your classrooms, including the advanced learners.